what Jesus says in order to come into that rest is, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and then you will find rest for your souls. So if someone is weary and heavy burdened by their sin, the solution is look at Jesus. Welcome back to our series, Exposing the Root of All Sin. This week we'll be looking at another vital heart attitude that enables us to overthrow sin's rule in our lives, humility. Pride brought about the fall of Satan and it put God and man at odds, resulting in the destruction of man. But humility undoes the damage of the fall because when a man becomes humble, God becomes his protector and friend. The role of humility in a Christian's life can hardly be overestimated, and we'll talk about it today on this episode of Purity for Life. Humility is one of the most important qualities for a Christian to possess because humility is in God's own nature. But the question we all need to answer is this, how does a person who is naturally proud become humble? We met with Ed Book, Vice President for Discipleship Programs here at Pure Life Ministries to discuss this important question. Today we're going to talk about meekness and humility, and I want to start off this way. Scripture at various places compares Christianity to being a soldier. So the person who is now a Christian has left civilian life. He used to be able to do whatever he wants. He didn't have to answer to anybody really. And now he's in this authority structure where almost every aspect of his life is being directed by someone else. I don't remember hearing Christianity described that way when I was growing up. Um, was it presented that way to you when you were in the church or was it described in a different way? Yeah, I didn't actually grow up in the church, I wouldn't say. But, you know, later in my college years when people uh, came and, and began to witness to me, uh, the way the Christian life was portrayed wasn't like you just described as a soldier or anything like that. Yeah. The message I clearly received was that Jesus was going to come into my miserable life and make me happy. Okay. <laughs> and I wanted uh, that, you know. Yeah. I, I understood, and the, and they shared some things. You know, I understood that I had sinned and that that I needed Jesus to save me from hell. But the emphasis was clearly on my present happiness, yeah. really. And frankly, uh, Nate, I struggled for for several years uh, through all of that uh, because I remember literally having a conversation with the guy who invited me to church, uh, and I told him uh, at one point that you know I've I've tried Jesus and he's not working for me. Oh, uh, wow. And then uh, you know fast forward a, a little a couple years probably, and I remember sitting down with my pastor at one point and and just telling him, look. You know, I was told that if I followed Jesus, I would have this joy in my life. And I feel like I have less joy than I've ever had in wow. my life. Okay. So uh, I realized somewhere along the line, probably at Pure Life Ministries years later, that, you know, I'd kind of accepted Christ like I'd been led to. Uh, but I knew nothing about being a soldier at that point uh -huh. or surrendering my will to okay. the Lord. Yeah, your story about you with your pastor saying that I feel like I have less joy than I had before really brings something to light, which is that there are things about the Christian life which are really confusing. Even in the, even in the middle of it, as we are progressing as we should, and one of those things is brokenness. Um, I wanna read a quote from Pastor Steve. He says that the Lord is most drawn to and infatuated with the one whose self-life has been crushed, beaten down, broken to pieces, and mauled. And, you know, that kind of thing is very hard to reconcile with the God of love that we're constantly hearing about in the presentation of the gospel. And 
it seems like from from something like that that God almost enjoys. He gets a thrill from just tearing us to shreds. What would what would you say to a person who is is getting that kind of feeling from what Pastor Steve wrote? Yeah. Um, well, let me start probably by elaborating just a little bit on what Pastor Steve uh, shared there, uh, because I believe most everyone's probably familiar with Psalm 51, where mm-hmm. David declares that the sacrifices of that God desires are a broken spirit yeah. and a contrite heart. And it's that Hebrew word broken there that is used in scripture, you know, 150 times or so. And it gets translated as Pastor Steve did there as crushed or beaten down or mm-hmm. broken to pieces or mm-hmm. even mauled in one instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that those more vivid translations really help give us a better picture of what needs to happen to our self-life. But God is definitely not uh, abusing us or gaining you know, some kind of sick thrill from causing pain for us. Right. <laughs> he knows that our self-life is conducive to pride. It, it's like the self-life is like a garden of Eden for pride. In your self-life, you, you know, everything is perfectly arranged to nurture pride and, and promote those selfish desires that we have. Yeah. Um, but it leads me further and further away from God. It leads me right into rebellion and carnality uh, and those kinds of things that will overwhelm us ultimately with pain and misery in this life and eternal torment even in the next. So we need to think of this pain of being crushed and beaten or uh, beaten down or broken as uh, the same way that we would think about surgery, for example. Uh, You know, when we have a serious medical problem, we literally volunteer (laughs) to undergo pain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we tell the doctor, yes, I want this surgery, uh, even though the pain is probably so severe that we'll need some kind of anesthesia, you know, maybe mm. literally put us to sleep for it. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But we don't hesitate because we know that the pain of that surgery is, uh, and even the residual pain of the recovery yeah. process are good for us in the yeah, long run. Right. They're necessary. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So dealing with our self-life, we just need to have that same kind of attitude. And and don't forget that we do have the Holy Spirit as our comforter from the Lord. The yeah. Lord knows it's painful, and yeah. he sent a comforter who would be with us throughout that entire breaking process. Okay, let me read something else from Pastor Steve's book because I want to talk about another thing that can be confusing about the Christian life. As the Holy Spirit begins the process of breaking the believer of self-will, he also starts erecting boundaries in his life. Before the person came to Christ, he was free to do as he pleased. Now he discovers that new restrictions have been placed upon him. He can enjoy life, but only within the limits prescribed by his new master. As he matures in the faith, he finds that those encircling boundaries become more restricting. Over the course of time, the believer is increasingly reined in as the Lord gradually exerts his will in the believer's life. And again, this cuts across the normal grain of our thinking. So I'd like for you to talk about why this is. Yeah, you know, Americans especially have a view of freedom that equates to being at liberty to do whatever I want. Mm. And, Mm. And Paul tells us, though, in Romans that everyone is a slave. And we all start as slaves to sin, but we don't have to stay in that bondage. Uh In verse 16 of Romans 6, he says, uh, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, Hmm. whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Paul ends the whole discussion here in verse 22 by saying, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. So Nate, really the freedom that we have uh, spiritually is the freedom to choose our master. We can choose sin and these other things that Paul describes here in this passage in Romans 6, like uncleanness Mm -hmm. and lawlessness and bondage and ultimately Mm -hmm. death. Or we can choose God and obedience and the fruit of holiness and everlasting life. 
And personally, you know, having experienced slavery to sexual sin for yeah. so many years in my own life, uh, I can testify that doing whatever I wanted to do sexually doesn't compare to the freedom that I now have in Christ, mm -hmm. the freedom that I have from addiction, the freedom that I have from fear, uh, freedom from suicidal depression, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, being free to actually love other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Letting God set the boundaries for me has been the best thing that's ever happened, honestly. Mm -hmm. And and I would choose being enslaved to the Lord over slavery to my own carnal desires anytime. Mm -hmm. What you were just talking about, the freedom to be unchained from sin and to be enslaved to the Lord, uh, that is the glorious hope of the gospel. And also in there is another one of those confusing things about Christianity because it doesn't always feel like this boundless freedom because now we're like in this conflict, this mortal mm -hmm. combat with our old nature, which has been crucified and yet is just in us resisting our forward progress into humility and our wholehearted uh, devotion to the Lord. And eminent Christians have said that that is a battle that we just have to fight all the way to the bitter end in a, in a certain kind of a way. That's right. And so how do you counsel people who they want to humble themselves and yet inside of them there's this thing that's like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah, well, obviously there's really no one-size-fits-all answer here, uh, and, and it usually re is going to require a combination of things. Okay. Uh, but the key, I think, is getting people immersed in the Word of God. Mm. Uh, so we'll teach them to pray Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 at the end of that psalm where it says, Search me, O mm. God, know my heart, try me, know my anxieties, see if there's any wicked way in me. Having them pray through that will definitely help. Uh, and we point out in the Bible then, too, the uh, repeated warnings there of those who exalt themselves uh, uh -huh, getting humbled uh -huh. by the Lord. And, and uh, of course, they need to learn to repent and uh, going back to people that they've offended, asking forgiveness is another thing that's going to help. It, it's un Doing that sort of thing is always uncomfortable and right. awkward at first, maybe right. even painful. Uh, but the more you repent to people, the more you just make a lifestyle of going to someone saying, I was wrong, will you forgive me? The easier it gets, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so with the counselees, though, we'll take a look at the consequences of their sin, uh, you know, really just hone in on the strife and the pain and the losses that have arisen and help them see that embracing meekness and humility is the only way to put an end to all of that misery. Right. Uh, we especially like to emphasize <clears throat> the character of Christ revealed in Scripture. Uh, we might take them to a passage like Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where Jesus is inviting those who are weary and heavy laden mm. to come to him for rest. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone loves that invitation, right? Sure. You, you know, who isn't sick and tired of bearing their sin and its consequences by the right. time they end up at Pure Life Ministries, especially, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, but that verse captures their atten attention. And, and then we take them to the next part of it, though, that what Jesus says in order to come into that rest is take my yoke upon you yeah. and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And then you will find rest for mm. your souls. Mm. So if someone is weary and heavy burdened by their sin and looking for that rest, the solution is look at Jesus, the mm. meek and lowly one. Mm. And the thing um, that I would say that has had the most impact on me personally in that process of, you, you know, just helping me to overcome that natural aversion to humbling myself that right, we were talking right. about is realizing that humility, real, true, genuine, you know, humility makes someone irresistible to God. Mm. Uh, and, and the thought that God would actually find me, <laughs> you, you know, because I saw myself very much as this unwanted, unlovable mm. wretch. Mm. And, mm. and the fact that God could find me irresistible just blew my mind. Mm. Uh, but that's exactly what scripture teaches us about the Lord. Uh, and it's the most intimate experiences I've had with the Lord uh, have come on the heels of being really humbled before him. Mm. As fallen human beings, 
pride is way more natural to us than humility. And sometimes when we see true humility, it breaks through all of our defenses and causes us to want to grow in it. So we decided to get some of our staff members to share about how seeing humility in other people brought about a breaking of their own pride. And we trust that these stories will give you a desire to exhibit humility to those around you. I've had a habit of going into a brother's office and um, kind of, whether work-related or not work-related, but just barging in and kind of starting off with what I wanted to say. And I noticed that he really wasn't paying attention much and he was uh, on his phone or uh, like literally looking away at his at his computer, continuing to type and not really listening, not really responding. And this went on for a while, and I kind of uh, criticized him for it, kind of like, man, you know, I feel like I'm the only one you treat this way. Like, don't you have time to talk to me? And, you know, just really got into self <laughs> that way, looking at him and all of his faults and wrongs. Like, yeah, you know, don't you have time to listen to what I have to say. A lot of times I understood if it wasn't work-related, but a lot of times it was work-related. And then I started to notice like a change every time I went into his office, he would like put everything down and like focus on me and like listen intently. And I noticed that change, like, man, something changed in him. Like whether it was work-related or not, every time I went into his office, he was willing to listen and very attentive and it really held up a mirror to me, like, man, I'm, I'm in myself. Like, I'm not thinking about his need, the fact that he's busy and he has a lot on his plate and I'm just barging in his office, you know, and, and wanting to express what I want to express and then I want him to listen, like, that's just kind of proud. And, you know, in the face of that, he humbled himself and like took the low road, like went under. And instead of correcting me, like that's what I would have done. Like, dude, can't you see I'm busy? Like, get out of here. He became Jesus. He became something in the face of my pride, in the face of like, well, I deserve to be listened to and uh, don't you have time for me and all this stuff. He lowered himself and yeah, he displayed lowliness that way. So when I came to Pure Life, I did not like cleaning. Uh, I did not like normal cleaning. I didn't find joy in vacuuming carpets or sweeping or wiping things down. And especially uh, when it wasn't when it was a mess that I didn't make. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a shock to me in my first week when I realized we were assigned a chore. And then my first day of work. Um, I found out at the end of the day we were required to clean the lines that we were just working on. So I was kind of confronted with, you know, what was in me in that area, but a specific moment that stood out to me was early on in my program, probably my first or second week, we got to the end of the day and we were cleaning and the student, well, I, I was just trying to do the minimum. <laughs> I wanted to get a broom, just clean where it was convenient, um, just kind of do a broad cleaning and not really get down into the specific areas. And so I'm cleaning and then I see the student, you know, doesn't, he's not looking around. He just on a dime, just kind of drops there and gets on his knees, his hands and knees and starts cleaning, starts really getting thorough in his cleaning, getting the areas that other people would have normally just not wanted to do. Um, and he didn't care about his clothes. He didn't care about who was watching him. He didn't care that it was going to take extra effort to do it. He just got down on his hands and knees again and just started brushing and cleaning. And I saw in that moment that inwardly, I did not want to bow down, bow a knee to, to clean. And the Lord used it to kind of reveal where I was at spiritually because spiritually, I did not want to bow a knee uh, to obey God or serve God when it's inconvenient for me. And especially if it involved, you know, other people. So the Lord used it to reveal my pride, uh, my, my spiritual pride, 
and just really how how high I was, even though I thought I was a pretty humble guy. And then also the Lord used it to reveal to me Himself. Uh, I just you know He brought the story of when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and or the the story of the woman caught in adultery, where He gets down and in a sense is cleaning up their mess. And the Lord was showing me in that moment that that's what He was doing for me. It showed me His humility, and then also um, kind of what He was calling me to come into in humility. So the Lord used it to help me repent of my pride, and then start this process of of coming under to serve others and to serve Him, and to do what was opposite, really, of what my flesh wanted to do. I remember a time a little ways back when I was very overwhelmed, work was really hard, and I just was feeling the weight of trying to be the person that I knew I should be in all areas of life. And my dad and I have ongoing phone conversations and something was happening during that time in these conversations that was really disturbing me. My dad is a very giving person and so oftentimes, you know, he's definitely communicated that to me, how I should, you know, help people, care for people. And every time it seemed like we talked during this period, he would bring something up like that. Give me someone to contact, something that I could do and kind of just say, hey, why don't you do this and, you know, contact this person. It really began to annoy me, honestly, to frustrate me and even to bring me on top of everything else to a point of being totally overwhelmed. So I knew I needed to talk to him about it and just share my heart. And one day I had that conversation with him. I remember walking by the side of the road and just telling him where I was at with this. I don't even think my heart was in the right place. I think I was very selfish in my focus, but it was legitimately how I was feeling. And something very powerful happened in his response. He didn't defend it, he didn't explain, he simply apologized. I don't remember the words, but just something to the effect of, you know, son, I'm so sorry about that. I I shouldn't have done that. You know, something simple like that. It broke me. I was trying to hide the sobs, you know, just instantly in my heart something shifted and I quickly hung up the phone and kind of walked into the woods there where no one would hear me and started praying to the Lord because really what happened was I sensed the heart of God. I saw I had been wrong about my father and wrong about the Lord. He wasn't laying a burden on me. He was my father who was pleased with me and loved me. And if my dad hadn't been willing to just be humble and kind, even when I was probably in the wrong to a degree, I wouldn't have seen that. But I really came to see something very real about God that day through my dad's humility. I'd like to take a break from these stories from the Pure Life staff and pull out the history book to share the story of a man who made following the humble example of Jesus his very life. George Mueller lived during the 19th century. He laid his life down to serve orphans in England for the sake of Christ, and he sought to keep the wickedness of pride far from his heart. Let's tune into his story and see what we can learn about true humility. After several years in ministry in England, George Mueller began to feel a great burden over the terrible plight of the orphans of his day. One quote says, his heart went out to the many ragged children running the wild streets. He decided he must do something and rented a house for 26 little girls in a residential area of Bristol. Over the course of the next several years, three more homes were also rented allowing room for a hundred more boys and girls. The remarkable aspect of Mueller's ministry was that he never made his needs known to others. He simply asked God to burden people to give to his work. 
This determination to trust God alone would be tested many times. The following story is typical of the way he depended upon the Lord for every need. One morning, the plates and cups and bowls on the table were empty. There was no food in the larder and no money to buy food. The children were standing waiting for their morning meal when Mueller said, Children, you know we must be in time for school. Lifting his hands, he said, Dear Father, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us to eat. There was a knock at the door. The baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast, and the Lord wanted me to bring you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread and have brought it. Mueller thanked the man. No sooner had this transpired when there was a second knock at the door. It was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage, and he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. No wonder, years later, when Mueller was to travel the world as an evangelist, he would be heralded as the man who gets things from God. In 1846, Mueller felt led to move the kids out of the tight confines of his neighborhood. Moreover, applications of other needy children continued to pour into his office. He had to do more. He began to seek God about the possibility of constructing a building. He believed that God's love for those children would not allow the need to go unmet. Three years later, the first orphan house was completed with more than 335 children. No sooner had this home been completed than George set out to build another one. There were still so many hurting children, and by God's grace, he would help as many as he could. Once again, he began to pray. He was not concerned about whether or not the Lord would provide, but about his motives. Would building another orphan house cause me to be lifted up in pride? He asked himself, there is danger of this. One-tenth of the service with which he has entrusted me would be enough to puff me up in pride. I cannot say that the Lord has kept me humble, but I can say that he has given me a hearty desire to give him all the glory. I do not see, therefore, that fear of pride should keep me from going forward in this work. Rather, I should ask the Lord to give me a humble attitude. Within nine years of building the first home, he had opened two more. This allowed for the care of over 1,200 orphans. By 1870, he had five orphanages operating with over 2,000 children being cared for. He once stated, if I was left to myself, I would fall prey to Satan at once. Pride, unbelief, and other sins would be my ruin and lead me to bring disgrace upon the name of Jesus. No one should admire me, be astonished at my faith, or think of me as if I were an amazing person. No, I am as weak as ever. I need to be upheld in faith and every other grace. Mr. Mueller died in 1898. Not long before this, a friend said to him, When God calls you home, Mr. Mueller, it will be like a ship going into harbor in full sail. Oh no, he said, it is poor Mr. Mueller who needs to pray. Uphold my goings, that my footsteps slip not. When I confessed my sin to my pastor uh, before coming to the program, the thing he told me that I needed to do was quit my job. And I did that um, because I knew it was the right thing to do, but I was still trying to hide a lot of that shame. And so I lied to my parents for a month and a half. I would talk to him on the phone 
a couple times a week and every time if they asked about work or how things were going. Even though I was a mess, I was trying to just do delivery driving for, for money on the side. Um, I would lie and tell them things were fine, work was well, and eventually it became obvious that uh, I was planning to come to Peer Life, and so I knew that I needed to, to tell them. And so I lied to them and said, I'll come up for spring break, and, <laughs> uh, and came up, visited them, and my friend had told me, as he was dropping me off at the airport, just don't lie to them. And so, you know, I was really worried. My mom was picking me up by herself, and I just was like, I don't want to tell her by, by herself. I want to tell her and my dad. But I was at the airport with her, and she just asked, how's work going? And I just had to say, I quit my job. This is the sin I've been in. And it shocked her. Um, it was hard for her. And she texted my dad and told him that things weren't okay, Patrick quit his job, it's not good, and so that he was prepared when he got home that night, um, and I, it wasn't just dropping a bombshell when he thought everything was going to be okay. So, you know, I have a picture of my dad sometimes like he's going to be harsh. I have a picture of God sometimes that God's going to be harsh with me. He's going to deal severely with me. I always expect the worst in things. And the first thing my dad did when he got home, he didn't say a word. He, my dad is not like physically affectionate with me very often, but the first thing he did was he came in, he gave me a hug, he kissed me on the forehead, and he just held me as he was holding back tears. And that was so, that moment has stuck with me and is such a picture to me of what the Lord did for me in my life. And it really, um, I think, was one of the things that God used to display his merciful and kind heart to me. Earlier in the show, Pastor Ed showed us how to enter into the humility of Christ by letting him lovingly break us over our self-life. Think of Jesus as a surgeon. He sees the cancer of sin in our lives and he knows how to cut us open and remove it. Why does he do it? Because he loves to hurt us? No, because he wants us to be healthy spiritually. That should help us to trust him in the painful process. But now let's finish the interview and answer the questions, what is the fruit of a humble life? And what can we expect to come out of us as we humbly walk with Jesus? Let's, let's um, switch gears here for a second. Pastor Steve brings up a really interesting point in his book, and he says that the person who is most humble and most broken is the person who will have the deepest experience of, of worship before God. Can you talk about how worship and true humility go together? Yeah, exactly. This is what I was really just talking about and trying to convey is that like whenever I've had some event or, or circumstance, some episode in my life that has really brought me down, <laughs> humbled me, you, you know, demanded that I come down and go under, the result of that has been an open door to greater intimacy with the mm -hmm. Lord. Uh, you know, I've literally become much smaller and God has gotten much larger. <laughs> and that's the perfect position to be in when you're going into true worship. Uh, God will use anything uh, that undermines a person's self-life to increase uh, humility in us. But I think it's when he gives us a clear revelation of who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, not just the sins we've committed, the wrong things yeah. we've done, but who we are, the, the, that inescapable truth uh, that all those horrible sins that we've committed flowed out of the pride and the extreme self-centeredness yeah, -centered, yeah. at the core of yeah. my being. Uh, and then in that place, you know, that vast self-love that we're in, mm -hmm. uh, that thing that has led us to just worship ourselves instead of God, that hideous self-love actually gets defeated mm -hmm. there. 
And, and at the same time, you know, while God's showing us ourselves, he also is right alongside that, giving us a revelation of who he is. Mm-hmm. We see his power and majesty, uh, the truth and reality of his great love. You know, yeah. it really is a great love. It's not just some lyric in a song, but when you see it and you experience it, that sacrificial love, laying down his life, becoming sin for us, mm-hmm. you know, we're undone. We melt, we we collapse, we fall on our face in his presence mm-hmm. and being prostrate before the Lord like that, Nate, that's, that's a picture mm-hmm. of true worship right there. Yeah. And it is not easy for us to desire brokenness. I mean, there's something in us that cringes. We know we're going to have to go through pain uh, and suffering to get that brokenness. But when, like you said, when you have those experiences where something has been broken off of your life or carved out, you know, the self-life has been removed in some significant way, there are a lot of spiritual fruits that begin to develop. Um, We talked about worship. Can you just describe some other spiritual fruit that you see develop when somebody's really dealt with? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, just like pride and selfishness produced an enormous amount of bad fruit in someone's life, you you know, there's a lot of good fruit that flows out of humility. And and almost always, I think the early fruit that we see out of brokenness is uh, someone's countenance brightens. It just, (laughs) they have a brighter countenance. Uh They're noticeably softer, maybe more tender hearted uh, in their disposition as a person. Uh, he's much more teachable, uh, far less combative and resistant, right, right. Uh, quicker to repent uh, when he sins or when he offends someone, you know, willing to, to make it right. Yeah. Uh, starts to notice the needs of others. You know, that's, mm. what, that's a big change that happens you know, when mm. he gets to that point where he's really starting to notice and see, not having to be told or directed, but right, right. voluntarily you know, recognizing these needs and just putting himself out there to, to start to, to meet those things. Mm. Um, there's life that shows up in his prayers if you're mm. alongside him in prayer. And and uh, just naturally, the focus has shifted from himself to others. And you can just pick up on that. Yeah. Uh, and over time, we see his character literally becoming more Christ-like. You know, So the fruits of the Holy Spirit there are showing up in his life, but they're real this time. You know, mm. Before, it was this great effort to prop him up there and pretend yeah. that he had him. But now you can you can taste and see, you know, and there's some substance there. There's real, a genuine love and joy and right. peace and patience and so forth. Uh, and um, that fake spirituality that he was in is gone and his inside world has really been transformed and you, you just can't mistake that. As I ended the interview with Pastor Ed that day, I thought about how good it would be if we would simply believe that the Lord knows what is best for us. The things that come into our lives, the trials, the difficulties, the perplexing situations, in all of these things, God's loving desire is to work in them for our good. Oftentimes, we think we know what we need, or we listen to what the world tells us we need, but only our Father in heaven knows truly what we need. No matter how humbling our individual circumstances might be, we have God's promise. If we submit to the humbling process he has for us, he will exalt us in due time. I hope that as you've listened to this, your heart has said, yes, Lord, I want you to do your work in me, whatever that means, so that you can have a home in my heart and be glorified in my life. Thanks for joining us this week on Purity for Life. We'll see you next time. Purity for Life is a production of Pure Life Ministries. For over 30 years, Pure Life Ministries has been the go-to for those whose lives have been devastated by sexual sin. Visit us on the web for more information about our life-changing counseling programs and powerful teaching materials. Also check out our video clips of men and women whose lives have been radically transformed. All that and more at purelifeministries.org.